It's the Lean Into Art Cast, the show where a couple of visual storytellers get to get... Oh, Rob, I get back. We get back to classic <laughs> Lean Into Art, and I trip at the start. It's the show where a couple of visual storytellers get together and, you know, engage with a visual storytelling topic, like the kind of things that you think about when you communicate visually, like whether it's writing, whether it's drawing, whether it's design, whether it's um, software design, game design, comics design, anything that where you're trying to put your thoughts into somebody else's mind or getting somebody else's mind to consider your thoughts through visual language. My name is Jersey Droz, cartoonist and teaching artist. The other host is... Hey, I'm Rob Stenzinger. I am a uh, coder and designer, mainly with like UX and games, user experience to unpack an acronym. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why I, you know, drew that circle around all those different things at the top, because yes, the Venn diagram of visual storytelling is Jersey and Rob, right? Sure, no, no, we, we have, neither of us have been filmed yet. Oh, that's true, no. Not really. Not really. I, yeah. I um, yeah, I have huge respect. Uh, I, I once took a course from the, um, let's see, what was that? What's that? Uh, the cable access, right? Where did uh, you really? Yeah, I did. I took the local cable access course when I was about 15 to be able to, you know, have, have free reign to check out, uh, some, some nice VHS heavy duty gear. And, um, you know, you got those like those big old weapons grade VHS tapes. <laughs> they did, they did, and and use their their mixing you know machines and all that kind of stuff. The the reel to reels, and it was uh like delightful and fascinating, and you know utterly, uh you know, I was using tools that weren't um, you know, uh it was kind of like trying to hit a power cord on guitar and having windows break from the awfulness. <laughs> you know so like but whatever yeah video it who knows it's an unconquered frontier wait a minute we're actually on video right now by the way that's Just true and down. how about this i'll tease for the final um the final thought i'll tease it at the top of this one we always do like we do like two sections of the show a couple of ad spots and then we have a final thought in the last five minutes of the show i'll tell you about the one uh television show i ever made called spaceman saves christmas we'll talk <gasps> about that at the end <laughs> And I could include a GIF of of me in that television show. That's all I have left of it, uh, which we'll, we conclude in the post for this episode at leanintoart.com and patreon.com slash leanintoart. Um, but Rob, this is our first time back together in a month. A month. It's been a wild June. So yeah, I mean, we, we started out with, uh, with a couple of weeks where uh, you were off on adventures and then I was off on an adventure. So yeah, this is... Uh... It's, it's been a while, not a typical thing for us, but, uh, but honestly, I guess, I mean, it's kind of been, a, it's been about time, right? We're, we, you know, recording this for what, uh, six years. Oh, good Lord. Yeah. Yeah. It was bound to happen. And, and yeah. as June is going to get crazier and crazier for us as the years go on, um, like I, for, for instance, what Rob's referring to in, as far as my adventures is, um, I co-organize uh, an annual event in Ann Arbor called the Ann Arbor Comic Arts Festival, or A2CAF, A2CAF.com. We just finished our ninth year of the show. Uh, oh, man, that sounds awesome. It sounded incredible. Wish I could have been there. Yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. It was, uh, I, wish, I wish it could have been, too. I really do. Your presence was, uh, your, the, the lack of your presence was felt uh, by, by not just me. Other people remarked on it. Ah, that's very sweet. But like, I mean, the, the heart of that show is this, this, it's this amazing event that you, you put on with your co-organizers and collaborators and at the, uh, the Ann Arbor district library, uh, every year for essentially comics of all ages. And you do an award show and all these workshops and all the personalities that, that gather. It's, it's, it's fantastic. I mean, and it's like, if you're hearing this and you have like FOMO or whatever, nah, don't invest in that. Just Put it on your calendar. Thank you for saying that. Thank you very much for saying that because that's that was like another takeaway from from that week was like you know I'm really I'm really fed up with this whole idea of trying to create FOMO. Um, yeah, you're trying. You, we're creating un, uh, unforgettable experiences for kids, and it's free and open to the public. So if you can't make it this year, just come next year. You know, it's mm. it's it's not it's not exclusionary. It's not meant to be like oh look at the fun we're having. Don't you wish you could be here? Well, yeah, we're having fun, and we wish you were there too. You know, so you should come next year. Um, anyway, but then you, Rob, you were at another really amazing festival. 
Yeah, I am. Um, I'm very fortunate where I have, I had to, had the chance to attend uh, the IO festival this year again. Again, I didn't know this was your fourth time doing it. Yeah. So it's been, I don't think it was four consecutive years, but yet, uh, you know, here we are, it's definitely four times for IO. And then I, then it was two or three times for sort of like the, the proto festival that IO grew out of. Right. And that was actually totally, that was acknowledged this year too, which was, you know, interesting to hear because so many people who were part of making um, flash belt happen made IO happen. And the kind of the big difference like between those two is that Flash Belt was a place where it was easy to tell like, hey, can you sponsor me workplace to go to this thing because I'm going to go get answers about this platform and be inspired, what have you, right? Adobe Flash was kind of the core of it, but it was a community of all sorts of people into, well, design and coding and data and interactive entertainment and visual storytelling and it's just, that that community then uh, and th those organizers organ organizers uh, grew IO out of it right so Flash Belt ended IO started this was like its seventh or eighth year mm. seventh year yeah and um, that is a it's more instead of an event about being you know here's where you get answers and I'm sort of paraphrasing one of the organizers Jared Thorpe and. Uh, it's more of an, of an event where you get interesting questions as your takeaway. Mm. That's very exciting to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and not to generate FOMO. It'll happen again next year. No, and of I, course, yeah. there's videos. Not any, it, It's funny. Now I'm a like FOMO um, disclaimer guy. Okay. Um, but like, uh, it, they have videos too for past events. And we'll have videos from this year on their Vimeo channel. So you can see like 2015, 2016 for sure. And, um, and then I'm sure 2017 will start to show up in the coming months. We'll link to that in the show notes as well. So um, EYEO Festival, if you're just listening mm -hmm. to the audio, uh, we were pulling up screen captures or sc uh, screen shares of the sites we were talking about. Uh, but yeah, so we both have been through some huge experiences, some, um, you know, engaging with different communities and different uh, learning experiences. And you had a really cool lens through which we could unpack these experiences rather than just do a play by play of, and then I did this and then I did that. And then this happened, then that happened rather like a rather a wrap up session, maybe explore. What was the angle that you uh, came up with for like how we should unpack our experiences? Well, there you, it's, it's unpacking. That's a, that's a nice approach where you come, you come to a, um, a, a session, something to participate in with a lot of feelings and ideas and some kind of core theme of what it's about. And the core theme is learning experiences, like a big learning experience in, in a way is what going to an event like, uh, well, A2CAF or IO, right? Where you're there to um, partake in a lot of sharing of information and also probably to connect and share some of your own as well as, as you make um, you know, conversation and discussion along the way and, you know, react and comment and what have you. Very cool. So do you want to uh, go to the first section of the show then? Yeah, let's do that. All right. Well, let me, let me choose some. Oh, I didn't choose any music yet. So let's see. I got okay. so I, I, I have such a, a, a riches of choices here, uh, but I'll just go with the one that I know will please Rob every time. Three, two, one, come back. All right. So where do you want to start, my friend? <laughs> so um, one of the things that, um, let's see, I find an interesting like tour reflect back on mechanism is, uh, I mean, I, I do the sketch note thing or doodling, capturing notes at, um, at talks that I attend. I've done this actually at A2CAF. As well, like when I've gone to the the especially the pre-event incubate, right? Yeah, and um, where you know you go to a talk and you you know bring like a sketch pad, bring some kind of pen or pencil that you're really comfortable with, um, just making some marks on the page, and then um, a little bit of just I mean I think 
most of my whole life I have scribbled while listening to people talk. <laughs> but then th there's like a, a couple of formal, formal-ish angles on that through like Mike Rohde's uh, sketch note handbook approach. And then, um, oh, oh, I'm, I'm ch choking on this name. It is the Doodle Revolution. Mm. Um, you're gonna look it up. I'm I'm looking at your sketch notes now while you look up the Doodle Revolution. So I'll, Suni I'll just... Brown, Suni Brown, Suni Brown's book, uh, Doodle Revolution. I mean, and both are basically they're advocates of of saying that getting symbols down visually is a is a handy thing. Like you don't have to generate a bunch of prose or a or a map of words as a hierarchy or whatever do whatever works for you. Like in, you know, if you have, happen to be so, you know, visually inclined and like to, you know, make some kind of symbols that aren't just the words and whatnot, uh, you, you can, you can do a quite a bit when you're, um, when you're listening to someone and get your own sort of interpretation of what you're hearing in like this doodle note form. So, yeah, this is at this is on your website, interactive-storyteller.com. We will link to this in the show notes as well. But I'm wondering if you could start by like kind of going into, um, you know, what what are some takeaways that you found at this IO festival? Because I remember, I, so we did an episode, and I should mention this, we did an episode of Lean to Art a few years back when I came to Minneapolis with my wife Anne, and Anne attended the festival with you, and we mm -hmm. did a whole wrap up episode where like it felt like it was this gigantic loaf of bread that none of us could finish this huge thing that we're trying to take a piece out of and we couldn't. <laughs> he just <laughs> felt a little bit foggy, a little bit full at the end. Um, <laughs> picturing a, a loaf of bread a marathon. <laughs> I, what an interesting way if we could consume knowledge in that fashion. But um, it, uh, okay. So some examples, some concrete things. Uh, uh, so there was uh, someone, uh, Molly Wright Stinson, who had a talk called uh, These Important Years. And uh, so looking back on this note, it's pretty, you know, like I can, I can start to recall like, like how, like overall take a tour of the kinds of things she shared. And it was honestly a good setup for the themes of the overall, um, the overall event in how there are when you partake as a designer as a as a person creating a thing serving um you know serving some kind of sponsor and audience there may be like extra details to the dynamic that you're serving and there may be sort of implied and um just accepted rules and whatnot like especially if you're coding and you're building something that is meant to, um, well, in some ways serve, uh, like, this is going to sound like just all conspiracy theory-ish, but that's not my intent. But like, in a way, like you're, you're encoding uh, rules and ideas or representing them visually. And then there's in inherently uh, things outside of that, where if you chose to take a moment and examine it maybe there's a way to critique that kind of work to know if, if is it inclusive enough is it um maybe uh something that could produce unintended consequences like um how we can let's see uh Mm. Cause what's funny is I don't want to pull up examples from other talks, but, but along this theme, like, like I was thinking of, uh, uh, Oh, let's see. There's a talk by, um, whoops, here we go. Matt, Matt Mitchell. <laughs> um, yeah. And I, it's, it's intense. Like his talk was called cyber Jim Crow. And he provided an, an example of, of, well, okay, here we go. There's a simple faucet at a sink and a soap dispenser. And then you have someone who has Caucasian hands, they get soap. 
You have someone who has African-American hands, they don't get soap or any other brown hands. They don't get soap. And like there, there was like a, a, a semi humorous video that someone made like a, of this thing where it's like, okay, here's me. I get the soap and now my coworker, you know, they don't get soap right back and forth and yeah. that kind of thing. Like, so this, this sort of like the bias that gets in that kind of comes along for the ride sometimes when we make things or maybe always when we make things and trying to just be better at uh, noticing it and trying to, I guess, become more robust and, and widely inclusive. That, that, that was like, that's like an under, underlying thing. Um, you're reminding me of a, a piece of advice that writers sometimes throw around when, in, with regard to writing dialogue is that nobody or few people say exactly what they mean. Right. Oh. So the trick is to write dialogue that suggests what their ulterior motive or bias or agenda is without them coming out and saying it directly. Right. Um, and not not to say that everybody's being in, in, intentionally deceptive, but everything we say and do is informed by thoughts, constructs, patterns that we've either inherited or we've constructed ourselves. But the, the, that that require or that invites scrutiny. Right. Yeah. And I think that's that kind of inviting some, some scrutiny in a constructive way to try to do more robust things. And then there was examples of like in Molly Wright uh, Stenson's talk where she talked about um, some interesting characters that were um, a part of like creating a computer language called small talk and mm -hmm. like uh, Ward Cunningham um, also created. Uh, so small talk was a way to express code that was a little more, mm, uh, approachable and natural looking than other languages at the time and included a lot of concepts that made um, that gave more it was it was called object oriented um, thinking that made it easier to sort of componentize stuff and get more reuse and whatnot so they they, they sort of pushed that kind of state of the art along by um, with their kind of thinking and uh, then Ward Cunningham also created uh, the wiki, right? Mm. Which is an incredibly flexible uh, mechanism to publish information and uh, then do so in a very interlinked way. And uh, then that, he was also a character in helping start um, the, the sort of agile movement. And so you get these, these um, uh, let's see, like through her talk and other talks, you find these kind of, um, well, examples of, folks who have explored ideas that um, that aren't just the, you know, I guess they, they're examples of how they have questioned and try to make um, something more empowering as opposed to limiting, right? As, as vague as that sounds, but. So what, what's the question you were left with after hers, after these important years? By my huh. Let's see. So I think with her talk and many others, I think that there are, uh, I, th as evidence through six years of this podcast, I do think a lot about making things, <laughs> but yet I don't dig as deep and seek that network of commonality and, um, the historical, almost like where my questions even came from before. So I, I think if, I think that would be a useful perspective to dig deeper. Yeah. No matter what you're making, I, I think that's, that's asking, uh, asking yourself to be like, uh, almost, well, probably like frighteningly on honest with yourself. Right. Which sounds, that sounds really trite and really easy to say. It requires like a lot of, self-investigation to get to that right a lot of triangulation with friends and trusted colleagues um yeah triangulation and and uh, and looking for signals and sources just outside of your own head um which like, which for instance be, which can be in history and which can be by pulling on the thread of like well what this idea that i'm using or that i feel so empowered or or whatnot by um whether it's a particular technology or tool or a um, or an idea, 
like um, like approaching things in a um, like a design sprint. That's something that's really big into my current approach to things. But like, there's clearly this is this is work that's been done many times throughout human history. It has to have have, have come up, right? And that's yeah. So there's more to it. I need to pull on that thread and and dig. Is um, but then there's of course. You could do that, I think, probably with any anything you're working on, like like digging into the history of comics. Mm -hmm. You will likely find um, motivations and reasons and ways to express and problem solve and what have you that are going to give you new insight on what you do. You bet. I mean, <laughs> uh, that was... That was rendered into stark relief when I went to the uh, Billy Ireland Museum right after a two calf, right? So like, yeah, we got a tour of the Billy Ireland. Another big adventure that was part of the like the the comics, the comic caravan, yeah, caravan. I was Which gonna was... say cookout, but it was not a. Cookout. <laughs> <laughs> it was a it was a hastily obtained hashtag. I think it was decided in the back seat of my car, like passengers were like, "What are we gonna call it? We we'll call it this." Um, it's a good, it's a good hashtag. Better than my memory. Well, it, and it came out of the fact that, like, for a part of the the the, the trip was like Zach and his, and Hannah and Ann and I were in one car. Keen Sue, Tori Wolcott, and uh, Katie Shanahan were in another car, and we were literally caravanning down to oh, cool. Indiana in a, in a horrible, horrible rainstorm. Uh, so that was that was a super fun adventure. But uh, it, the adventure concluded with us going to the Billy Ireland Cartoon Library and Museum. And if you haven't been there, it's in Columbus, Ohio, and it is on the campus of uh, OSU, Ohio State University, and it is a museum of comics art. And when you walk in, there's like this whole feeling of like, this is a building, it's a big stone and marble building, it's like a proper museum. And you feel like, whoa, this is like a hollowed place that that uh, treasures what we do, like our, our field, our craft is is honored and revered here. But we also got a private tour where we were going so, through. Can we pause on that? Yes, please. Okay. So your craft is revered. So, okay. Tell me about that. Like, Tell, tell you about that. So, so it sounds like it stands in contrast to other places, right? There. Yeah, sure. Okay. So like why and, and what, did that, what did that feel like? So why? Like, well, when I go to some parts of Michigan uh, or work with some institutions, there's a little bit of a ramp up where I have to explain to the fellow stakeholders why comics is useful. I have to make a case for why even bother with this comics jazz. Um, and there is, you know, some historical baggage that it carries in that it is um, throwaway literature for children or you know, uh, a narrative with visual support. And there's like a, almost a condescending kind of like, well, that's nice. This is a wonderful tool to get kids interested in reading so we can get them onto real books. Or it's the thing that the comic book guy from The Simpsons loves and it's all about superheroes and Aquaman kissing Wonder Woman. And it's not about real literature. It's about nerdy uh, fixations and fandoms after all. And it is a lot of those things, but it's also this wonderful form of communication that going off of your sketch notes thing um, can communicate very effectively using really complex combination of word and image. And this is a building where that tradition is respected and revered and archived, right? So you walk into these rooms where there's archives and there's carefully preserved comics pages from 1902, you know? Um, and this, like the, the 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 clearest symbol for me of what like what I found moving about this place is you would have a Prince Valiant piece on the wall, Bill Watterson piece, Calvin Hobbes on the wall, um, Jack Kirby, Alex Toth, Todd McFarlane, right? So like just this enormous spectrum. Oh, oh Kathy Guy's wife, right? This enormous spectrum saying all of this is comics and all of these people matter. These, these, these are being treasured in this place, and we're going to provide you with historical context. And when we got the tour, we got that historical context through Jenny Robb, the curator uh, at the museum. So, uh, yeah, getting a sense of what the history of your medium is, um, 
where it came from, what kind of people struggled with it, what, uh, what kind of people, um, how people solved the different problems at the different times. Not just like, oh, they used whiteout and these people didn't, or they used Zipitone and these people didn't, but also put in the context of, of the times in which these comics happened, right? Mm. Yeah, it's easy to characterize and not appreciate something about the experience and the motivations that are different or how they are the same and how you how you're building off of this this wave of human endeavor that didn't originate last year with the release of a marketing product right Right. And uh, yeah, and that not that that the new product doesn't matter. It does, but it, but it but it appears within a wider context, right? So like um, Clip Studio Paint, Manga Studio, ha, like are are have a have a relevance, whether you pull on the thread or not. But you may find greater um, connection, motivation, like new problems to solve, ways to I don't know tools to embrace or or avoid based on seeing what other people have done so so you don't it's not just summarized where like hey those people in the 90s you know used whiteout like this blip 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 uh and then people in the 2017s go undo undo you know yeah, right it's, you know a, and also not not to fetishize things but like like they had chester gold's art desk there chester gold the guy who did the dick tracy comic strip hmm. it's like right there and like you could like if you if you really want to be a jerk you could reach out and touch it you know it's like but they'll they, they won't smile at you for doing that but um but like you can see all the ink stains and like these these smudge marks and burn marks and like just like the 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 this object that was used for an entire career right and there's even notes on like oh, how he like you'll notice there's burn marks on the table it's because he would use a lighter or a match to uh hold under his comic strips to dry the ink faster so he can get more work done uh, I don't know, little little stories and pieces like that uh, to help. Well, I mean, as, as cliche as it sounds, it humanizes these people. They're not just legends anymore. These are like real people who struggle with the stuff that you're struggling with as a cartoonist. Um, I th it, in the, to me, it sounds like there's a humanizing of, so what you're describing is like a humanizing of the past. And what I'm describing is a humanizing of the present too. So like when you come to solving, like, you know, you build up a toolkit of like coding and data and uh, video game present presenting things digitally or whatever, right? Uh, you may get some kind of impression or focus or fetishizing of the present or only barely slightly recent past right it's typically the now and also what's about to happen that that's that's fetishized whereas um you know like you're describing that happening to the past that can happen to the present in technology focused things and giving it context of like there this has been going on for a long time. That was an, another common theme at IO where, um, you know what, artificial intelligence has been thought of in, a, in very meaningful ways and also exemplified since like 1958. Mm -hmm. So that's not, it's, you know, like right now you'll, you'll see how a pundit may spit out a thing and have like, the computers are going to, you know, be no problem. Computers are going to, you know, hurt us all. AI is what I mean, like whatever they're doing, it's serving an agenda and it's likely not being inclusive of that thread that is built upon so much prior effort and perspective. So it's a good, it's good context. That was another one that like both Zach and I were noticing in the exhibition at the Billy Ireland, they had all these political comic strip pieces and Mm. It, they could have been written yesterday, but these are from like the 60s, from the 70s, and it's about uh, corruption in government, money in politics. When is the when is the Republican Congress going to finally, you know, show some spine against this president? Honest to God, the, these were real comic strips up on the wall that we, I, I, I wish I would have taken more pictures of them. I was so caught. It was one of those things where I was so caught up in the moment. And like afterwards, I was like, ah, I didn't take it. I took like three pictures. But um, it was it was eerie how timely a lot of those felt even though they were from another time and it showed that it, it, it rendered into perspective like 
the times that we live in now, right? Uh, showing that it's some of these problems just haven't been solved yet, right? Or, or maybe I should say this: P, the problems that people observed persist to today. There's a nice neutral way of saying it, right? So, uh, we're we seem to be proposing that there's a benefit to getting exposure to those problems and those those circumstances and in having some greater familiarity as opposed to just a surface glancing one right. and um well I, I honestly a pretty great way to do that is to partake in some kind of event because it gets you out of your your day-to-day -day and and you may have a chance to do something like maybe it's a quest like i think what you're describing going to that museum is is more of a quest then, but like then there's something like you know connecting to um a bunch of approaches in a wider community to, at something like a2calf or then there's the the ideas and what what's being noodled or chewed on at something w where an event that's meant to generate you know, lots of questions and you someone who makes and designs things um like io either way you're getting out of your day-to-day -day and do you want do you want using that as a way to dig in do you want to tease, like maybe talking about like ways of getting to these things and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. negotiating the investment required in order to go on these quests? Yeah, there's, um, let's see. So I suppose, yeah, we can question, let's question the quests yeah. and, uh, and maybe the investment. Yeah, that's sounds good. Yeah. And then we can maybe go into a little bit about like, well, how do you even know if the quest is worth going on? Yes, we, we wouldn't blindly advocate jumping in a car and spending a lot of money on hotel rooms to go to these things sight unseen. Like, what signals do you look for? And what signals do you look for once you're there? We will tackle all of these things in about a minute and 30 seconds. How does that sound? It sounds excellent. All right. But first, we have to thank some people who make this show possible. And those people happen to be the people who support us on Patreon. If you haven't heard of Patreon, it's basically like a Kickstarter. But instead of for one-time or semi-annual events, it's for ongoing events. So you pledge like as little as a dollar a month, and that you know enough people do that that makes this show sustainable. And we want to thank five people who have been doing just that. Uh, shout out to our Patreon supporters: Angela Mitchell at Angie Makes Stuff on Twitter, Todd Lozon, Lozon, Master of the Universe, can be found at at Todd L A U Z O N. Uh, also, Nathan Seabolt. Nathan is on Twitter at N underscore Seabolt. And then Rachel Ross, NYC Terrace. So it's like New York City Terrace. Uh, thank you, Rachel, for supporting us. Uh, and, you know, both both the, through high fives and through the Patreon support. And then finally, Kim Holm, Denunger Holm on Twitter. We will link to it in the show notes. Fabulous cartoonist um, with the unspellable Twitter handle. Well, it's totally spellable once you see it. Once you, you'll, you'll see it and you'll be like, oh, it, it sounds just like how Jersey said it. And if you want to join the Patreon community, you can go to patreon.com slash lean into art where you will find the shows that we post every week, as well as the extra leans, the shows that we do just for Patreon supporters, or when those episodes become uh, a private thread just for the folks who support us there. It's a safe place to talk about whatever you want. Thanks to everybody who has supported us on Patreon. It means a lot to us. Patreon.com slash lean into art. So here we are on the other side of the, of the break, <laughs> we made it. And, uh, so yeah, you wanted to like, let's, let's question this, uh, this investment because, um, because it is a thing and, and it's not, it's not trivial. Like when you are doing your, um, your, your solo, um, independent efforts, right. Um, it's not, maybe it's not even trivial too, if you're, if you're funded or sponsored through like, um, through a day job or, you know, or a client, uh, right. because at, at some point you need to sort of like, how do you, how do you give the right context of the value of this kind of thing? Right. I mean, like a, a major way to give, to find out if there's value in context is if you're being paid to go there. Right. So if the event sponsors you to come out, that's that, that takes a lot of that stress off of you in the first place. Right. And it, it makes the decision-making process a lot easier, but that's um, not a lot of us get that opportunity. Right. Um, so mm. then it becomes like, how, how do I determine whether or not this, I, I, the way I've looked at it in the past when I've gone to, comic cons or conferences is uh 
it's an investment. It's an investment in my career in some way or another. But then I, and I know I've like 10 years ago on the art and story podcast, I remember I went to a convention with Mark Rudolph and we both felt like it was a poor investment. It was not, we didn't, we didn't accurately or thoroughly research it. And upon getting there, we realized, wow, we spent a lot of money to be at this thing where we really don't, we're not getting a lot of value out of it. I don't think we're the right people for this event or this event's not right for us. Right. We learned the hard way. Uh, yeah, so, there was, um, let's see. So, I mean, having, okay, but the learning part is valuable. Like, how do you, how do you know? Sometimes like you must've had a little bit of signal that this was worth an experiment, right? Sure. Um, where, where, I mean, you, you took a risk. That well, okay. Not, yeah. Like you can get rid of all the risk. The risk was mitigated by distance, right? So, okay, it's relatively close. It was in Chicago. And it's like, okay, from where we live, that's like, you know, four and a half hours. Not huge. We're not crossing the whole country. Um, You know, there's a lot of attendance there, right? So there's a lot of people go to this thing. Surely, uh, if there's enough people at a thing, the tiny percentage of audience that we have of, of people who would be interested in the stuff that we make would be larger by that logic, right? So Hmm. there was, there was some consideration. We didn't just blindly jump in, but there was like, but you know, it's now I would be a lot more careful before going to, I would look very carefully at the, the events webpage. I'd look at like, do they have like a, a statement of, you know, a mission statement, um, and what is that mission statement? Do they have it, right? Who are they trying to serve? Does, do, are they trying to serve the same people I'm trying to serve? Um, does it look like in their mission that I have any skills that I could contribute toward that mission, right? So like, for instance, the Toronto Comics Arts Festival, they have an educators, educators day and like a kids programming track. And they had a call for submissions. Do you want to lead some programming for educators or kids programming? And I'm like, yes, I can contribute in that, that area, right? Oh yeah. What a great signal Yeah, that um, it seems like something that you can contribute to. There is a mechan- mechanism through which you can attempt to contribute. And that's uh, yeah, those are really good, really good signals. And then uh, if you are doing some kind of contribution, hopefully there's some sort of value exchange where there you, you have been provided admission or something. Right. Yeah, and then if you're providing a lot of content, it, it, all the, somewhere between like admission to, um, you know, travel and lodging to all the way up to, you know, fully compensated if you're providing um, something of high value to that event because, you know, they should be engaging in trade with you. Um, that's, that's, that's a really good point. Um, I do like to look for that in events. And um, then there are events where I'm able to be sponsored to go to where it's just, it's sort of an employer arrangement, right? Where, Hey, this is part of my ongoing, you know, skill sharpening education, and I can provide enough context where this seems um, safe to sign off on, right? And that's um, that that can work too. I mean, it's a little bit of um, it's almost like you can't escape pitching at some point, <laughs> like. <laughs> You know, you're, 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 you're pitching to go there to exchange some value. You're pitching to like, um, whether with the event as a conversation, or you're pitching with someone to sponsor you to go to the event. I mean, I feel like that's a topic for a future episode. Cause I was just having this discussion with a student of mine and where they were kind of wincing at the thought that like, but I, I don't want to pitch. And I'm like, but it's all pitching. It's, and it's all you earning people's trust. Everything is you slowly chipping away to earn everyone's trust is it to quote you rob nothing gets done without trust right Mm. well i like your interpretation of it is your interpretation of it is is more useful than just just the proclamation of like well you know you're trapped with with without getting uh and guess what you can you can hack the trap by getting trust good luck i'm out but uh, <laughs> no, that's you, you can't fight city hall, kid. Don't even try, right? I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm not. I'm not going to say that to a kid. Um, I, yeah, of course not. Of course not. Um, like okay, but let's see. The there's another angle on this too, where if you have the the um, 
some events, not everything is, is, the, is a conference level expense. Not everything is far travel. Some of it's near. And so there are ways to sort of mitigate the, um, the monetary cost. Then you have to find a way to justify your participation in it. And some of that can be as, um, I don't know, this is in the territory of like, give yourself permission and you eat a piece of chocolate and whatever kind of stuff. But like, it's a little bit in that territory, but it inherently like you need to ask yourself, why are you, why are you looking at this thing that is potentially nourishing? You, if you already feel confident in it and you have the ability to afford it, and through whatever evaluation, it's like, okay, you've got the time on your schedule. You can, you know, it's, 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 it's low cost to travel to, what have you. And, and it's a quest or an event, whatever it is. And if you're still kind of hesitant, um, there, was a, there was a talk that isn't exactly about this, but it really, I think, points out some, some, um, some helpful alternate framing of things. And like, what do we value at, in our endeavors? And, and like, why do we think, well, we always, we have to fill our days always with things that are the monetary exchange things, right? And so there's a great talk by Jenny O'Dell, um, which I didn't do great sketch notes for um, because the evening keynotes, it's dark. <laughs> it's hard to sketch in the dark. So there's that. But um, uh, yeah, Jenny O'Dell provided um, one of the, um, one of the closing two closing keynotes um, that at IO and um, she actually links to a, uh, a medium article based on that talk already. So like you can consume the heart of that, that her message right there. And it was all about how to do nothing and more or less the value of just, you know, not trying to frame every single thing as an, an, this is my paraphrasing, but like as an industrious transaction for your time, attention and money and whatnot, just mm. be, just being a person in a place, things are going to occur to you. Like the other, like that other productivity stuff will get done, that kind of thing, you know, with, and the talk was not naive in saying that like, well, we don't need to show up to work on time, <laughs> that right. kind of stuff. Right. It was more, there's probably space for some of this and uh you know i've been i've been seeing it passed around on the web recently among some of the cartoonists that i follow um this this notion of being bored is quintessential to writing right or to being creative um, hmm. and leaving space to be bored not occupying all of your time with like oh, I'm 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 knocking down all the bowling pins today you know I'm on fire bam 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 uh, <laughs> it reminds me of that like this idea of like as it says in in uh, Jenny's session um, let me pull it up on the screen you know decades before the advent of social media as we know it uh, Gil Gail de Luz observed that it was a relief to have nothing to say the right to say nothing because only then is there a chance of framing the rare and ever rarer thing that might be worth saying. Nothing has become more precious in today's economy of attention than nothing. Yeah. It's great. It's yeah. It's very much the opposite of action reaction. So, you know, there's a tweet, here's a hot take. Yeah. Totally yeah. the opposite. And not that that isn't a natural human thing to partake in as well, but like, there's, you know, that's a different kind of effort. You'll get different outcomes through that, that through that effort. Um, you know what I'm also reminded of is that, that Taoist principle of like, what is it that makes a wheel useful? It's the hole in the middle of the wheel, right? It's the nothing. Mm -hmm. Like the moment that you decide something's good, you have to decide something's bad. And it's, uh, it's it, it, the bowl isn't what's useful. It's the space inside the bowl, that kind of thing. That, that, that nothing has to exist um, as well. And sometimes that's the best part. Sometimes. Mm -hmm. Is that a, a, a Taoist would never tell you that anything is always one way or the other, <laughs> <laughs> which is, and, and I think yeah. you you instantly fail Taoist club by talking about being a Taoist too. So that's true. <laughs> a yeah. True Taoist wouldn't even talk about Taoism. <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah, I've yeah. Okay. Uh, anyway, big fan. Yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, so, um, what about so you know, like what, what kind of uh, signals can? Well, okay, so we talked about like investing in events and like looking for signals of like how you can help or like what you can learn. Um, is this something where there's like a, a an ethos or an attitude that like sounds like this is a culture that seems harmonious or resonates with me, and I'd like to try to swim in those waters a little bit because like when you go to I/O, Rob you're not necessarily, you're not doing talks, you're not necessarily contributing in that way. You're contributing mm -hmm. through interacting with people, right, while you're there. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, I guess uh, the kind of signals that, because um, I, I mentioned, I, I'm fortunate to have, you know, been able to attend this kind of event like four times. And, uh, or not this kind of, this specific event four times. And that's, um, some of the some of the things that I've noticed that I find like really worth returning to. It's like there's this. Uh, it's been an event that's been very principled from the beginning, as far as like trying to be inclusive and diverse. And uh, it's it's. I've been to many events that that aren't that that just maybe maybe there's too many people that look like me or talk like me, and that feels weird and not as enlightening, not as surprising, not as um, connecting. So yeah, that's been a good thing to notice um, that there is a specifically like, you know, ahead of time, look at the, look at the lineup. Are there a lot of, uh, is there a diversity in, in, in gender and um, like, let's see, um, gender identity, right? And is there diversity in, um, in, in culture and race and that kind of thing? Uh, diversity in maybe having some cohesion, not like this is the chaos. Welcome to chaos con. It's okay. about whatever the heck, who knows we, we, but whatever, like is, it has an aboutness to it that you're like, I am attracted to the, to that aboutness. Um, and like, like IO has this thing of like, there, it's not like there aren't, tools and tech discussed ever i mean there are are i mean there's a variety of tools from like from like data science and visualization and animation and storytelling and and like the many threads that and like uh journalism and stuff that comes up over and over again design solving hard problems that kind of thing it's like well okay that sounds very interesting but then is it diverse okay yeah um but then when you're there, okay, you take the gamble, you've justified going there once. I mean, hopefully there's tons of signals you're getting then from like, well, what's it like to be in the crowd there? What's it like to chat and partake? Um, and I can say the same thing about A2CAF. I mean, I think that's an amazing event. It's like the, like things emerge out of that crowd and like the crowd does nice things. Yeah, uh, something that we, as or organizers of the show, and I was getting ready to, to bring this to react to your uh, your points, like from a different standpoint as the person who's actually organizing the event. Mm -hmm. We do our very best to, because it's a juried show, free table, so there's more demand than we have capacity for. And so we have to unfortunately say no to some people. And part of our math is... Um, does this person do do we either know or have evidence that this person is the kind of person who is open and engaging and operates out of a sense of um, abundance rather than scarcity and here's here's a perfect example i took a picture of this at this year's a2 cap walking in as the show is getting set up and mia gosling a local cartoonist who does a comic called good tickled brain uh it's you know, stick figure Shakespeare comics. They're hysterical. They're so good. <laughs> now they're I have her one of her posters. Yeah, that poster's that poster's amazing. Is it the one where it's like uh the flow chart of how to decide whether or not <laughs> yes, which which awesome. Shakespeare play to read? Yes. So good. Um anyway, so I walk by Mia's table and there's a sign on there. There's two other artists at a two calf. Now there's not a lot of tables. I think we have like fifty artists. It's not a huge show. But there's two other artists who have Shakespeare comics. So Zach Gialongo was there with his Stratford Zoo Midnight Review uh, books. And also Sean Manning with his book about Macbeth, or his comics adaptation of Macbeth. Mm. Now, what does Mia do? Does Mia say, oh, crap, I'm in direct competition with these people? No. She puts up a sign saying, oh, if you're on my table, you probably like Shakespeare. 
well, here's two other tables you should go to after you go to my table, right? She's doing freaking reader's advisory at the show and encouraging you to stop at other tables at the show rather than making her table the only stop, right? Mm. That I felt like, like, how privileged I am to be part of a thing that encourages that kind of culture where the artists there, even if they don't know each other, they support one another. Um, I don't know. I, I, I know that... that fantastic it's getting squishy but like i i was really moved by that and so i want to give out a shout out to uh me one more time uh good tickle brain dot com <laughs> uh, i mean it's a perfect example i mean that is a that's an emergent thing so that that's in a way there are um i guess there's a crowd that is part of the um part of the events presentation and 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 experience and content where they are they are part of the event as the um representing the provider side in some way but then there's the event as far as the crowd and the attendance i think good like nice things emerging from either or any or both aspects are a great indicator um like this isn't exactly the same but like there are like i've noticed that you know essentially speak people who speak at IO seem to participate and engage and attend other talks as well. Right. That is this, awesome. There's not like, Oh, there's the chariot arrives and this, you know, oh, the, the person with the knowledge showed up and then when they're done, they wave and you know, away the chariot goes. No, they're, they're there as well and partaking and learning. And it's just, it's, it's pretty cool to see. Um, no, that that's really cool that that's that's an enormous signal to look for is um because somebody who is there to speak did an enormous amount of work to put together that talk an enormous amount of thinking and effort went into being able to do a talk of io caliber right guaranteed um, yeah so one could easily I want to say excuse, but understand if after doing that talk, you're like, look, I got to go back to my hotel and just like lay down because like that was intense. <laughs> but for them to have a hunger for experiencing the show that everybody else has is that 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 shows an investment in the culture that they have, right? They're not just there to do a paid gig. They're there to work hard and also to participate and learn hard and all that stuff, right? Mm-hmm it's it sends a signal it really does and that's that's one of the things that that i find attractive about about that that event i'm certainly i mean i'm curious and so clearly like i mean if you can you know find the budget time whatever the i'm in I, i'm giving you know a wholehearted endorsement to io like you know i will link to it in the show notes as well and if you have the you know the time and can afford it you know you should go it's it's awesome and then uh i am deeply curious about the a sister event that i've been trying to uh instant th that's instanced yeah yeah um Anne went yeah uh, this past year and I'll, I'll have to connect you with her about that um because i you know i obviously i wasn't there for that one um, mm -hmm. she went on her own but uh it sounded pretty awesome so <sighs> but much much smaller scale so it was more intimate which Changes the dynamic as well, right? All right. I'm going to follow up with Anne about that then. All right. Um, another event that I would point at, if like if everything we've been talking about sounds exciting to you, and if you're anywhere in the Midwest area, this is another one that like I can't endorse enough, is Cartoon Crossroads Columbus, which is only a couple years mm -hmm. old. Um, and it's uh, put together by Jeff Smith and uh, you know a whole bunch of different stakeholders in Columbus area, Tom Spurgeon. Um, but it's like, it's, it's, uh, how to describe it. It's like IO in the sense that there is programming from dawn till dusk and even after dusk, right? Like there were, there were days where there's just like, there's, there's talks, there's an artist alley, there's programs and there's art exhibits. And then there's after, after art exhibit parties and your the city of Columbus turns into this gigantic place that just treats comics like they matter, like comic books and comic creators like they matter. Um, and I, I mean, I was, I was seriously just shaken by how intense and awesome this show was. Um, it's not just a Comic-Con, it's like 
it's like a proper festival, like a real like four day festival. So I, I I remember your reactions from this. I'm glad you brought it up. This it sounds like a pretty amazing experience. Like what's uh like what what's one um I mean the honoring of the comics endeavor and okay. whatnot. Yeah. Okay. So like, there was there was multiple art exhibitions going on. Some at the design school on campus. Uh, some at the Billy Ireland uh, Cartoon Museum and uh, Library and Cart- Cartoon Museum. Um, and then there were talks with like you know stellar like uh, really important car- cartoonists who contributed in very important ways to the medium, like people like Seth, like really great talks with them, like really well moderated discussions. There was uh, an sort of an educator or education style pre-conference event, like sort of like A2 Incubate, but um, really mostly panel discussions, but really intense and interesting panel discussions about a variety of topics, about like the nature of the, of the business. So here's a panel of publishers. Let's talk with them about like, where do they think the industry is going? Where has it been? What's happening next? What patterns do you see? And having a moderator who really asks them tough questions and puts them on the spot, which is really cool. But then also about comics history and diversity in comics history and, you know, forgotten cartoonists. Um, but then like, then, then you'd have the artist alley. You'd have like signings and talks with like, say, Sergio Aragones um, and uh, Stan Sakai. And then afterwards, another showing of art from uh, the March trilogy by uh, Nate Powell and John Lewis, um, followed by just like a party at like a. Uh, it was, and it was open to all. This wasn't private stuff. There was this. There's this big party at like a. What was it? it looked like it was. Um, an old warehouse that got converted into a bar. And mm-hmm. and it was this huge event where there were so many cartoonists, but it was also very intimate because like we were just standing around, like just like chatting casually with with cartoonists like Sergio Argonas and Chris Schweitzer. Like we're all just mixing like you like you should, mm-hmm. right? And the, the again, they did this amazing thing with the culture where um I would get introduced to people who maybe are doing edgier, more intense, maybe more um, adult-oriented stuff. They find out what I do. What do you do, Jersey? Oh, I make comics about a pig that rides a tortoise and, you know, fights chicken wizards. And there was <laughs> never this, like, step back of, like, okay, well, maybe we don't have anything to talk about. We found common ground on everything, right? And, like, everybody was eager to find that t- common ground. It, and it felt very natural to look for that. Um so it was it's just this very positive place where everybody where you get, I got the sense that in in an industry that feels very fractured sometimes it's rare to go to places where it feels like we are all trying to communicate visually through this medium whatever kind of story you're trying to tell whatever kind of thing you're trying to say mm. uh, let's celebrate what makes that so special so that's 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 amazing yeah the uh, the what a great signal to look for and it's hard to do if you know from afar it's just that if if you go to an event and you see that it has that sort of unfracturing effect that it's really collecting and including and combining perspectives that's uh, that's powerful and it's it's pretty great to be a part of even if it's like alien and un- uncomfortable it's probably going to be nourishing in some way like if it, that one of those things of like if it's out of your comfort zone yet you probably won't regret it. <laughs> yeah. Um, which I don't know. It's, I think like we've had like a pretty good final thought on like the topic, but like you teased the thing in the beginning here oh. and I'm wondering what did I tease that? in the beginning? So you teased this thing called spaceman saves Christmas. <laughs> That's right. Oh, we'll have to keep playing with this this technique of teasing these things because that after going through all that, I'm like, do I really want to talk about some silly t- television show that I made when I was in high school? But we'll do that. How about that? Mm-hmm. Um, okay. So um, in about two minutes, minute and thirty seconds or so, we will uh, talk about a thing I made uh, twenty five years ago <laughs> called Spaceman Saves Christmas, and I wish I still had it on tape. But before we do that, we got to thank some more people who make this show possible, and those people happen to be us. We make this show possible. We make this show every week, but we, you know, what what fuels the show, what informs our thoughts and discussion that we do every week is the stuff we make. And so, of course, we would love for you to interact with the stuff that we made. 
And the thing that I most recently made is a comic called Boulder and Fleet, which you can find at boulderandfleet.com. And what is it? It's a story about a bear and a bird who are best buddies who go on adventures together. They're adventurers for hire. So they look for work. What's their work? Adventuring. And that's going to get them in trouble with all sorts of different kinds of mythical monsters and things. Um, animals, people, clothes, super cute. And it's, uh, you know, my attempt to, to do intense, awesome action and adventure, but in a gentle way that... Uh, sort of quietly addresses the topic of uh, what is the role of violence in adventure stories. And you can find out what the conclusion is uh, to that thought at boldenfleet.com. Rob, you make a game. You make a gentle game. I know. And, and like, like, what is the role of violence in stories? How powerful that is, right? People need to engage with Boulder and Fleet and, and, uh, and explore your questioning. Uh, because it's still fun. It's not like, you know, oh, no, there's no more violence. Guess we're sad now. <laughs> um, and that's the, that's the situation with this Panda needs you. This is, this is not a violent game. Um, it's pretty mellow actually. And by design. So you, you're, you know what, you're here to help this Panda because this Panda needs you as the title says, uh, put things right. And what you're putting right is, is stacking blocks. It's this physics, um, you know, stacking shapes and patterns kind of game where, uh, Panda shows up, here's a level for you to face. There's a stack of blocks. A cloud comes along, whoo, knocks them over, and now it's your job to to put things back to the way they, to the way they were. And um, it starts out pretty easy and simple, and then it gets more and more challenging over like fifty plus levels. And uh, it's available for your iPhone and iPad. Hopefully, coming to other platforms soon, -ish, oh. maybe. I would love to hear from you and, uh, you know, get some reactions, votes for different platforms. Uh, so, you know, hit me up on Twitter. You'll hear that later on. But like uh, to check out this panda right now, you can uh, get it in the iTunes app store. And if you, learn, if, yeah. if you did purchase it or if you do purchase it, giving it a star review, five star review would be super useful. That helps more people find it. It really does. It does help a lot. And uh, I do de deeply appreciate that. So yeah, it's it's at uh, the ideas and learn more about it kind of thing are at this dash panda dot com. This panda. And if you are here saying like, look, we just tune into this show because we like listening to the way you guys break down ideas. Fair enough. This is a product that we make, just like our comics and our games. But we also make other things that are like this show, and that is at leanintoart.com slash workshop where you can find all sorts of uh, different comics and video game workshops that we've created that you can download at a price of your choosing, even if that price is zero. Although if you download it at price of your choosing that happens to be zero and you find immense value from it, another thing you could do is you could go back and you can like buy it again and it'd be like tipping us for the, the cool stuff that we make. And that's at leanintoart.com slash workshops. And if you, you know, if you've already done that, you're like, what else can I do? Because I really believe in you guys and what you do. Well, besides signing up for the Patreon at patreon.com slash lean into art, the thing you could do right now is if you're watching the video on YouTube, giving it a thumbs up. That helps more people find the show, raises our rankings in YouTube search, a very important search engine. Or if you're listening to it in a podcatcher, like whether it's Overcast, whether it's uh, Stitcher or iTunes uh, or Google Play Music, giving the show a star review, five star review would be super awesome. Helps raise our, our our rankings in search and helps more people discover the show. More people that discover the show, the more people interact with our stuff, the more sustainable it makes the whole thing. And we thank everybody who has done all those things we just talked about. Yes, thank you very much. All right, final thought. Final thought. There's a uh, thing in the world or somewhere that existed once upon a time in the world. It requires a time machine, but... but well, I'm going to go to my Google Photos now. Because I think right. I have it in here. Um, Space Man Saves Christmas. Um, so, uh, no, no search results in there. I'll have to just put the GIF in um, in the post. Okay. Yeah, because I'm not finding it just by doing a quick search. So, um, when I was in a senior in high school, I took telev television production class. And... What was like both wonderful and disappointing about that class was is that it was really largely treated as a blow off class by a lot of seniors because it's like, oh, we just get to make TV shows. How, you know, how important is that? But like I, as the guy who wanted to go into comics, was like learning new storytelling principles, right? <laughs> so I was like, I, I should have class like really serious. Like I, this is like. I would have loved to have gone to high school with you, honestly. <laughs> Cause I actually, I, so I took the, I took that court, the, um, the community driven one through, you know, like, uh, 
um, oh, what do you, the, the same oh, thing? Yeah, the community television, like, yeah, whatever. Yeah, but, but I took the high school class too. And that's where I learned a lot more about the more formal roles and jobs and how the, how the, how the, um, flow of a show gets managed especially if there's a live performance and the 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 technical director in the booth and all that stuff i mean you know it's it's neat to learn that um but okay so i interrupted that storytelling um a new yeah medium. so I, I showed up to this class like really like i wanted i i wanted to use it as a way to level up my storytelling skills right hmm. um and so I tried to do all my, pro like most of the projects that were done in that class were like, you know, kids sitting in chairs, like having like, uh, what was that show that, uh, what is it? Between two ferns or whatever, right? Like that Zach Galifianakis does like that kind of talk show with like a little wooden table between two chairs with a black backdrop. Um, <laughs> Cause that was really easy to do. Right. Um, but I would do like, okay, well, can I do a Viverin commercial? Viverin being that like caffeine pill that was really popular in the 90s where like, okay, I'm going to hang myself upside down, put the camera upside down. I'm going to have to light it so it looks natural. So that when I take my hat off after I take the Viverin, my hair stands up, right? Like stuff like that. <laughs> That's fantastic. Which I, I never got like, and this is the disappointing part, is like I never got really awesome grades because I kept challenging myself to do interesting things and like they never really worked right. So like it was, it was like, a for effort, but your execution is terrible. So you're getting a B plus or B minus on these projects. Um, but one of my last projects I did in that class, uh, I found this stock footage in like those giant uh, weapons grade VHS tapes in the back room. And one of them was like helicopter footage of this town called Frankenmuth, Michigan. And I know I've talked about Frankenmuth with you before, Rob, but in case anybody hasn't heard me talk about it on the show, um, mm -hmm. it's this little german village in michigan it's like uh a, a german friend of mine described it as bavarian disneyland you know it's this, it's this little touristy town where there's all these quaint old uh german style houses and restaurants and stuff and uh so and i found this helicopter footage i'm like well wait a minute we got a chroma key set up over there i could chroma key my chroma key being like the green screen technology um i could chroma key myself flying over frankenmuth what could i do with that and and it just so happened to be like the beginning of December. So I wrote a holiday special called Spaceman Saves Christmas because I had a Superman shirt. And so I was like, well, the S stands for Spaceman. <laughs> and, oh, I found, I found the GIF. All right, here we go. I'll pull it up. So this is, this is me at 17 years old flying over Frankenmuth, Michigan. Let's see if I can zoom in on that. This is oh like my. all I have left. Wow. Oh, come on, GIF play. There we go. Not very good. <laughs> Doesn't even make any sense the direction I'm flying. Uh, and look at that '90s hair, so so attractive. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, nice green screen work. <laughs> yeah, it was just a, I just had like a big table that I threw green carpeting over and like jumped on it. But um, but again, it was like I bit off more than I could chew, and so like. I wrote an entire script for this this show that was written entirely in verse. So we had to like everything oh rhymed. My gosh, because it was a holiday special, and so I had to get like the the other kids in my class to like read the dialogue. So like I'm acting out the scene with the villain while they're reading my dialogue over top. So it's like a storybook kind of thing. Um, <laughs> and and the most probably the most uh, possibly not true, but as far as my memory uh, leads me to to believe is. There's a fight scene in it, and um, where the, the the kid in my class, he's playing the villain. He was a nice guy. We were friends, but I don't think he got that. Like, like he he was trying to really sell the violence. So like, I and this is why I wish I had the videotape because I really got beat up on camera. And like, oh. it's a good thing that I had the guys in my class reading the script for us because I wasn't mic'd because like it, I kept saying like, okay, that really hurt. Stop it. <laughs> <sighs> Oh no. And at one point he he literally DDTs me, right? And that's when you put the person's head through your arm like this and like you grab under their one of their arms and you fall backwards and hit their head on the ground. But uh yeah, it was it was a fun project. I don't know why we brought that up in the first place. You know what? It 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 doesn't matter because <laughs> it's a thing unto itself that is worth learning about. Um <sighs> so holy moly. <laughs> there was um like I honestly will have to listen back because I don't know why we brought it up or why I, I didn't know it existed. So it's um, uh, Spaceman Saves Christmas and, and, yeah. it, and it only exists as a gift now. 
<laughs> and you're fine. You're you, where wherein you are flying sideways through a parking lot with a castle in the background. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And I remember, I remember at one point there was one line in the script where it's like I I actually say like you know why they call me spaceman because I have an S right here. <laughs> <laughs> like it, I, it doesn't get explained why I can fly or anything like that. It just he's a he's a nice man who flies this guy has an S in his chest and wants to oh and he wants to save Santa Claus. Santa Claus is captured by a bad guy and so he has to save Santa and get beat up in the process. Mm. Uh, anyway, it, it, it makes sense. <laughs> and I don't think I got a good grade on that project. Gosh, what a what a tough teacher! Because come on, that GIF alone makes it seem like uh, okay. You did good green screen work. There's some, you know, there's a lot. There's a this was ambitious. I think is, I is think he was, he was to... looking for production values though, oh, and okay. like I never really had those because I always asked. I always wanted more than what my fellow students could deliver, and I wanted more than what I could deliver. You know, so yeah. But, so I who knows as far as the dialogue in the background I imagine it wasn't I mean, as robust and wholehearted as you were hoping it wasn't. but um, but the thing is if you went solo I bet spaceman could could have sold the heck out of a lawnmower in a fake commercial and then gotten an A plus right ah <laughs> uh, yeah now I wish but, you were there <laughs> well right. I mean I I this uh, we've all made our spacemans so. We've all made our spacemen. <laughs> That's this. This That's is hard. Hard. Yeah. Oh. All right. Well, I know what I'm making for next year's A2 calf for when you arrive. Is we've all made our spacemen. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Oh, oh, good. Well, this is fun, Rob. Thank you. It's good to be back. And yes, it is good to be back as well. So, and all right. All right. So, um, the show will be archived at leanintoart.com. And uh, we're going to shout out some more links to some different social media stuff in a second. Uh, but we record every week, Thursdays at 10 p.m. Eastern Time, 9 p.m. Central Time. Uh, and we'd love for you guys to be part of the live stream. And we have a live stream link now, which is uh, leanintoart.com slash live. That's where you can always check to see where the latest uh, upcoming live streams are going to be. So until next time, I have been jerseydros.com. Or no, no, that's not my address at all. That, that that's that's the bassist oh my gosh what's wrong <laughs> oh no there were only new base purchases no lean into art.com and jersey on twitter and i've been rob stenzinger of lean into art.com and rob stenzinger on twitter okay bye show notes for this episode can be found at lean into art.com you can also follow us on twitter at the user lean into art and you can reach us via email at leanintoart at gmail.com. And remember, leaners aren't wieners. Thanks for listening. Okay, I'm going to shut off the stream. Thanks for hanging out with us, everybody. Yeah, thanks for hanging out.